Welcome to Physics 235. This is week 12, day 3, scheduled for release on Friday, April 10th. And today we're going to talk about image formation from mirrors. Today's lecture covers, again from volume 3 of the textbook, section or chapter 2, sections 1 and 2. So we've talked a lot recently about how light interacts with objects. When it reflects off of objects, it obeys the law of reflection. When it refracts, traveling from one material to another, it follows Snell's law. But what we haven't talked about is how our brains interpret these rays of light when we observe them. So when you look into a mirror, why do you see a copy of yourself, something we will call the image later on, behind the mirror? And that's what we're going to discuss today. And everything about image formation that you need to know comes back to one simple statement that's easy to remember. Your eyes are dumb. And to explain what I mean by this, let's draw some object, say a pencil, and put it in front of a mirror. So here we have a mirror where the flat side is the side that's the reflective surface, and we are going to put an object in front of this mirror, perhaps something like a pencil. Beautiful, I know. So when you are looking at the mirror, you're standing on this side of the mirror with your eyes kind of out in this general direction. And I'm going to draw two eyes here because people have two of those things. So if you are going to view the pencil, well, light could come directly from the pencil to your eyes, but this would be you just looking down at the pencil that's sitting right in front of you. For you to see the image of the pencil in the mirror, the light ray is going to have to bounce off of the mirror. So the light ray traveling to your lower eye here might come into the mirror like this from the pencil, will obey the law of reflection and reflect back to reach your eyes here. And we'll have something similar for the other ray, which I'm going to draw in a different color. So the other ray will also follow the law of reflection, and to reach your other eye, which I've drawn as a little higher in this diagram, we'll have to hit the mirror at a slightly higher position than the other ray. So these are the two rays from the pencil, or the tip of the pencil, that reach your eye. So what I mean by your eyes are dumb is that your eyes can clearly see this blue ray coming in right here and this red ray coming in here. But what your eyes and brain can't tell is that that light was reflected sometime along its path. What your brain does without you even needing to tell it to do so, this is automatic, is your brain makes the only assumption it can. When your eyeball, this one right here that I'm labeling in blue, detects this light ray that I've labeled in blue, it makes the assumption, hmm, that light ray must have been traveling the same direction forever. So as far as your eyes and your brain are concerned, that blue light ray came from back over here. And your brain will do the same thing with this red ray as well. So it looks as though the rays that represent the tip of the pencil actually came from this location right here. So when you look into the mirror, this is where the tip of the pencil will be located. We'll turn out the rest of the pencil is there too, and I didn't really leave myself room for it. Whoops. But it will look like the tip of the pencil is right here. So this over here is called the image. This is where your brain sees the pencil when you look into the mirror. And this all comes back to the fact that your eyes are dumb. They do the only thing they can do when they observe a light ray. They assume that light ray has been traveling in a straight line forever. And we're going to add one more piece of vocab right now. Because the rays don't actually cross right here, back where the tip of the pencil is, 
then we will call this a virtual image. So we'll use a virtual image, or we'll call it a virtual image when the rays don't actually cross. So before we get into curved or spherical mirrors, we can talk about a couple other examples with plane mirrors. One of those is when you have two mirrors that make some sort of angle with each other, you get multiple images. So if you look at this image over here on the left, you can see a tiny little Lego head that's been placed next to two mirrors that make a right angle of each other, and you see multiple images that they've labeled image 1, image 2, and image 1, 2. And whichever image you see will depend on how many times the light ray has bounced off of the mirror. So up here for image 1, they have traced out the path of two light rays. One light ray comes from the object, bounces off of the mirror, and heads out in this direction. The other light ray comes in straight to the mirror and bounces out straight back out the way it came. So if you're out here on this side of the mirror, put your eyeball right there, for example, then your brain does the only thing it can and assumes both of these light rays must have been traveling the same direction forever, so they must have come from this location right here. So that's where your brain sees the image. And this process repeats itself for the green image, image 2, over here on the right. But for the purple image, we have a little additional complication there. So let's follow one of these light rays through. This light ray right here comes from the object, bounces off of mirror 1, then strikes mirror 2 and bounces off of mirror 2 again, and heads back out this direction. So if you're out here observing the rays that are bouncing off of the mirror, your brain will assume this light ray came in a straight line forever, back from this location right here. It will turn out we always have to draw at least two rays in order to figure out exactly where the image is, because if we only trace the path of one ray backwards, we just get a line along which we know our image lies. And it's when we bring in the second ray and trace it back that we've really zeroed in on the location of our image here. So it might be intuitive for you that the image is as far behind the mirror as you, the object, are in front of it, but I want to show you how that works out mathematically. So first, let's draw ourselves a plane mirror. So this is our plane mirror, and I'm going to put an object out here. The object is kind of the counterpart of the image. The object is whatever original well, object you have that you've placed in front of the mirror or in front of the lens, and the image is what you see when you look into the mirror or the lens at that object. So this is our object. And I want to follow the path of two rays of light that are going to interact with this mirror. The first ray of light is the one that just heads straight in towards the mirror from the object. And since that meets the mirror normal to the surface, the angle of incidence will equal the angle of reflection, and that light ray will come back out precisely the way that it came. And another light ray that I want to consider is just a light ray that travels along some other path. We have a light ray that comes in from the object to the mirror here. It will bounce back out, obeying the law of reflection. Heading out this direction. So now we have two outgoing light rays, and we can imagine viewing these light rays, this one here, or this one here, and think about our eyes being dumb and what that means. So for the red ray, your brain does the only thing it can do and assumes that ray must have been traveling in a straight direction, unbent, unbounced forever. So your brain assumes that the red ray came from back in this direction. Correspondingly, for the blue ray, your brain assumes the blue ray came from back in this direction. My diagram is not very to scale. 
I need to adjust one of my rays here. There we go. This is the reflected ray drawn more to scale than it was before at least. So your brain assumes the blue ray came from back out in this direction. So as far as your brain is concerned, the light that came from the object and bounced off of the mirror must have come from this location right here. So this is the image of our object. And it is a virtual image because the light rays do not actually touch. So the light rays never actually crossed out here, it just looks like they came from that location. So to define a couple distances here, the distance between the object and the mirror is called d sub o, the object distance. And the distance of the image from the mirror is called the image distance, which is given the variable d sub i. Now, it will turn out that d sub i is actually negative in this case, so I'm going to label this distance as the absolute value of d sub i. And I want to convince you that for a plane mirror, the object distance and the image distance have the same magnitude. We can see that by comparing two triangles. One of those triangles is this one right here that I've outlined in yellow, and the other one will be this triangle over here that I'm going to outline in orange. The two triangles share this side right here along the face of the mirror, so they both must have the same length for that side of the triangle. Both triangles also have a right angle here at the bottom of the triangle, so both of those angles are 90 degrees. And because of the angle of incidence equaling the angle of reflection, if we call this angle theta, that means this angle and this angle are also theta by opposite interior angles and the law of reflection. And then by the laws of geometry, this angle is also theta. So we know that both of these triangles have this side that is the same. Both of these triangles have the same angle right here for 90 degrees. And both of these triangles have the same angle out here that I've labeled as theta. So these are, by the laws of geometry, similar triangles. So we can say that these bottom two pieces of the triangle that I've labeled with the double purple hatch marks are also the same distance. Thus we have shown that the image distance equals the object distance for a plane mirror. We'll get more to sign conventions when the image distance is positive and when the image distance is negative a little later in the video. But for now, it's enough to know that the image is behind the mirror, so the image distance is negative. And if we're dealing with plane mirrors, then the image will always be behind the mirror. So the image distance is always going to be negative for plane mirrors, unless we get to a really tricky type of scenario that we're not going to get into in this class. The next scenario I want to talk about is a little more complicated, but also a little more interesting, and it is for spherical mirrors. Spherical mirrors are called spherical mirrors because their surface, the surface of the mirror itself, follows the shape of a sphere. And spherical mirrors can either be convex or concave. So if we imagine a sphere made of glass, if we chop off a piece of this or a slice of that glass, we will have a spherical mirror. So a concave mirror here is shown in orange, where this little gray line that you can't quite see very well, but the gray side is the reflective surface. So you would be standing on this side of the mirror over here. And the bottom here in blue is a convex mirror, which again, the silvered side is on the right, so you would be standing out over here to the right of this mirror. And convex and concave mirrors will have very different properties in terms of the types of images they make. 
The next thing I want to define is something called the focal point. The focal point of a light is defined such that when all of the light comes in parallel, parallel to the other light rays coming in and parallel to what's called the optical axis or the principal axis, this line right here, that just goes straight through the mirror, then that light will go out through a location called the focal point. And we can see this in the diagram at the bottom on the right here that I've just circled in red. All of these incoming rays here that you see coming in that I'm kind of marking over in green are all coming in parallel. They're parallel to each other and they are par parallel to the optical axis that's represented by this horizontal red line. And then all of those rays, after they bounce off the mirror, all cross at this location right here. So this location labeled with capital F is the focal point. And there's another variable here that's worth knowing, which is called the focal length. And the focal length is this distance right here. It's the distance between the mirror and the focal point. And the focal length will be given as lowercase f. So capital F refers to the focal point, and that is a specific location in space. Lowercase f refers to the focal length, a distance between the focal point and the mirror itself. Now I want to, real quickly, talk about what might happen if we have a convex mirror. So this mirror is going to be oriented with its shiny side on the left, and we could have, as before, all of our light rays come in parallel to the principal axis and strike the mirror. And each of those light rays will bounce off of the mirror following the law of reflection. So these outer two rays bounce off this way, and this middle ray, since it strikes directly in the center, perpendicular to the surface, will be sent back out the way it came. So, much like we did earlier in this lecture where we thought about our eyes being dumb, we can then trace these light rays back. Your brain is going to assume that this is where all of these outgoing rays came from. So it the rays, again, don't actually cross, but it looks like they crossed at some point in their history based on your eyes or dumb. So this location right here, where all of the rays seemed to come from, is still a focal point, but it is known as a virtual focal point. And we'll see a little bit later that this difference between a virtual focal point from a convex mirror and a real focal point from a concave mirror will be accounted for in our math by a positive or a negative sign. The only other relationship that I want to go into right now is how the focal length relates to the radius of curvature of the mirror. So if we go back up here to this diagram that I've circled in purple, and I just want to look at one side of this one, say the blue side. That spherical mirror follows the shape of the surface of a sphere. So that sphere that this mirror is cut from will have a radius that we will call r, where r is called the radius of curvature of the mirror. And it will turn out for spherical mirrors that the focal length is precisely half of the radius of curvature of the mirror. And there's a geometrical proof of this in your book, but I don't find it that illuminating, so I'm not going to go into it right now. A couple of things I do want to talk about. One is something called a spherical aberration, and why we actually in real life might want to use a parabolic mirror. It will turn out that all of the light rays don't cross at exactly the same point for a spherical mirror, at least not for a large spherical mirror. So if you look at this image in the center that I have in the bottom that I have circled in orange, this is what actually happens when you have a large spherical mirror, when you've used a large chunk of your sphere 
to make the mirror. You can see that some of the light rays cross here, but some of them cross all the way back here. So we've got a little confusion in where in this region our focal point is. So to avoid that confusion, we can do one of two things. One of them is we can use a small spherical mirror. So you can see that the mirror in this red circled image has a little bit less of a curve to it than the mirror in this orange image. So if we use a small spherical mirror, using only a tiny portion of the surface of the sphere for our mirror, then the small angle approximation comes into play and the spherical aberration becomes very small. Or, if we don't want to have to worry about spherical aberrations at all, we could use something called a parabolic mirror, which I have circled here in green. If you make the mirror match the shape of a parabola, then all of the light that comes in parallel to the principal axis or the optical axis will all cross at the focal point with no aberration or little mismatch of the, where the light rays cross at all. And this is why the fanciest, most expensive telescopes have parabolic mirrors inside of them, and why a lot of uh, certain kinds of uh, solar power plants that collect light in big parabolic mirrors, they focus that light directly on the focal point at the center, and they have a tube of some liquid like oil there that heats up and absorbs the energy that way. We're going to spend a lot of the rest of this lecture exploring what happens when you put an object in front of a spherical mirror. So we'll consider concave and convex mirrors, and we'll consider the object being placed at various different object distances. And we're going to do something called ray tracing. But before we do that, I want to introduce some of the sign conventions we're going to be dealing with, how we tell if objects and image distances and focal lengths and object heights and image heights are positive or negative, as well as defining a couple new variables. So here, that they've labeled in red, and I'm going to mark over in an, another shade of red, is our object. And the distance of the object from the mirror is known as the object distance, DO. Then, we'll go through some process to find our image. And here, they've done it for you, and I'm coloring over the image in blue. And the distance from the image to the mirror is the image distance, di. We'll also define the size of our object compared to our image. Does the image in the mirror look bigger than the actual object itself? Does it look smaller than the actual object itself? So we'll need to know the height of the object and the height of the image in order to determine this. So over here that I'm mousing over in orange is HO, the object height. If you are standing in front of a mirror, you are the object, so your object height would be equal to your height. Then, over here, we have the image, and our image is smaller, so this little distance that I'm mousing over in green is called h sub i, the image height. And all of these quantities are related to each other using an equation that will later be called the thin lens equation, but we're going to use it for mirrors here. And that equation is 1 over the object distance plus 1 over the image distance equals 1 over the focal length. Now the focal length isn't actually labeled in this image, so I want to put it in here for us. We are given r, the radius of curvature of the mirror. And we know that for spherical mirrors, the focal length is equal to half the radius of curvature, which means the focal length would be this distance right here. Dropping that down. That means this point right here must be F, capital F, the focal point. So now I want to define one other quantity, and that is called M, the magnification. And the magnification will be equal to the image height 
divided by our object height. So the magnification will tell us how much bigger or smaller our image is than our object. And it will turn out that you could show this with a little geometry that I'm not actually going to get into, that you can calculate the magnification by image height over object height or by negative of the image distance over the object distance. So now with all of these formulas, I want to actually get into the sign conventions. And the first sign convention I want to talk about is for the focal length, F. The focal length is positive when you have a concave mirror, and it is negative when you have a convex mirror. Next, I want to talk about the object distance. And the object distance is fairly easy because the object distance is pretty much always positive. Technically, the object distance is positive if the object is on the same side of the mirror as the incoming light rays. So for just a single object in front of a single lens, or sorry, a single mirror, this will always be true. So we don't need to worry about this one too much just yet until we start to get to situations with multiple mirrors and multiple lenses, and we'll revisit this assumption then. Next is the image distance, di. If the image is on the same side of the mirror as the object, the image distance is positive. And will be negative if the image is on the opposite side of the mirrors on the object. Last but not least, we have our image height and our object height, which have these same rules for their sign conventions. The object and image heights are positive if the object is upright and negative if the image is inverted. So in terms of arrows, an arrow that points up is upright and an arrow that points down is inverted. Usually we consider the object to be upright, whatever orientation it has, and inverted is just upside down of that. So let's go through the image we have here and double check if ever all of these values are positive and negative. First, the focal length. This is a concave mirror, so we will have a positive focal length. Then, the object distance. Well, we've said our object distance is pretty much always going to be positive, so we'll stick there with positive. And our image distance. Our image is on the same side of the mirror as the object, so our image distance will also be positive. Our object height, we'll just take the arrow pointing upward to be upright, so we will make our object height positive. And then when we look up here at the image, this arrow that I moused over in blue earlier, you can see that arrow points down. So our image is inverted, and we will have a negative image height. Thinking briefly about the magnification, which we haven't talked all that much about yet. So down here, in the corner. We're going to talk about the magnification, but I haven't left myself much room there, so I'm going to do my writing in the upper left. If HI, the image height, and HO, the object height, are both positive, so if the image is upright, then we get a positive magnification. And conversely, if the image is inverted, like our image is in this picture, the image height is negative for a positive object height, which means we will get a negative magnification. We can also think about what it means for our magnification, for the magnitude of our magnification to be bigger than one or smaller than one. So think about what it means for our magnification to give us a value greater than one. Well, this is a fraction of, I like to call this the hi-ho formula image height over object height, hi over ho, or hi over ho, also equal to negative dido. But if the magnification is greater than 1, then that means the image height has a larger magnitude than our object height, 
So we say in this case that the image is enlarged or the image is bigger than the object. And the converse of this will also be true. To make the magnification have an absolute value that is less than one, that means the image height has to be smaller than the object height in terms of magnitudes. So if the image is what's called reduced, meaning smaller than the object, we get a magnification whose magnitude is less than one. So we're going to explore all of these in a few examples, and we're going to go through all the mathematical work, but we're also going to draw some diagrams called ray tracing diagrams that will help us verify our mathematical answers with something we might expect conceptually from our diagram. And in order to do that ray tracing, I need to teach you how to draw rays for your ray tracing diagrams. And there are four of what are called principal rays that you can draw to locate your image when you're doing ray tracing. So here we have a concave mirror with the optical axis drawn through it, and I need to label a couple points. One of those is the radius of curvature of the mirror, or the center of that mirror's curvature, labeled as C. The other one is the focal length, which is halfway between the center, or halfway between C and the mirror, so this is our focal point, which means our focal length is the distance between F and the mirror. And we're going to look at the behavior of a few different what are called principal rays. So let's draw ourselves an object here that we can deal with. And I am going to put my object out here somewhere. So the first principal ray we can draw will follow the following rule. If the ray enters the mirror traveling parallel to the optical axis, it will exit the mirror going through the focal point. So let's draw this ray. So we have a ray that is entering the mirror that is parallel to the optical axis. So our ray might come into the mirror traveling this direction, parallel to the optical axis. And that means this ray will exit the mirror passing through the focal point. So this ray will travel down in this direction. We will also have kind of the reverse of rule one as well. So if a ray, if the entering ray passes through the focal point, then the exiting ray will be parallel to the optical axis. And let's draw this ray as well. So lining up my ruler here, the entering ray passes through the focal point on its way to the mirror. Therefore, my exiting ray will come off of that mirror, passing or traveling parallel to the optical axis. Every time one of these rays hits the mirror over here, it is following the law of reflection. And if it doesn't quite look like it from my diagram, that's just my diagram not being completely to scale and that mirror not being completely circular in shape. But the principal rays are ways that we can draw things without having to get out a protractor every time we want to draw the rays. The next principal ray we can draw follows the rule that if the entering ray passes through the center of curvature, then the exiting ray also passes through the center of curvature and the ray will be reflected back out the way that it came. So let's draw this ray. So our entering ray comes into the mirror, passing through our center of curvature, then our exiting ray will be reflected back along the same exact path, traveling in the opposite direction. Last but not least, we have our fourth rule. Any ray that hits the mirror directly at its intersection with the optical axis will be reflected symmetrically about the optical axis. So, drawing that ray, 
That means our incoming ray, we draw all of our rays from the head of this arrow that represents our object here. If that ray strikes the mirror right where the optical axis is, well here, my normal line is my optical axis. So the angle between the entering ray and the optical axis will be equal to the angle between the exiting ray and the optical axis. And if you've done everything appropriately here, all of your light rays should cross at the same point. And it looks like I've actually done a pretty good job because all of my light rays cross in this little region right here. So the only reason they don't cross directly on top of each other is because my drawing skills are not perfect. So this is where our image will be located. And we can draw the tip of our image arrow right there. And since the tail of the object arrow is on the optical axis, the tail of our image arrow will also be on our optical axis. So this right here is our image. And in this case, the rays actually do cross. It's not that they appear to have crossed because your eyes are dumb, like with plane mirrors. All of the rays actually pass through this point right here. So we will call this a real image. So I'm going to use these same colors for all of my principal rays in the following diagrams. So it might be good to make note of which colors I've used now so that you can tell which ray I'm referring to later. I'll explain which ray I'm drawing, but it might be helpful to have this written down in your notes as well. So we're now going to do some ray tracing, and then we're going to back this up with calculations for our thin lens equation. So let's pick some values here. Let's say the focal length of this mirror is 10 centimeters. That means the radius of curvature is twice that, or 20 centimeters. And let's put our object at a distance of, say, 15 centimeters from the mirror. So our object distance is going to be 15 centimeters. So that means my object will be halfway between my uh, focal point and the center of curvature of this mirror. I'm going to make the object good and bold, so it will be very easy to see. So first, let's draw our ray tracing. First, we have the red ray that will enter the mirror traveling parallel to the principal axis. And then we'll bounce off of the mirror and travel out through the focal point. So that ray will travel along a path that looks a lot like this. The next ray we want to draw is the blue one, the ray that travels into the mirror through our focal point and then exits the mirror traveling parallel to the principal axis. So that ray would come into the mirror this way, passing through the focal point as it comes into the mirror, and will exit the mirror traveling parallel to our principal axis. So parallel to our principal axis would look like this. Now notice our rays are already crossing. We technically only need these two rays in order to determine where our image will be. But let's go through the rest of the rays just to make sure we know how to draw them correctly. So now we have the green ray, the one that travels into the mirror through the center of curvature of the mirror. So if we start to draw this ray, we might say that ray starts at the tip of the arrow and goes this way, through the center of curvature. But that ray is not going to hit the mirror. So we're going to make use of the fact that the path of a light ray is always reversible, and we're going to draw that ray initially going the opposite direction, as though it came through the center of curvature. So if the ray came through the center of curvature, it would then go this direction into the mirror and then would be reflected back out the same direction it came. And wow, this diagram is going to be very much not to scale. So doing the best I can. Last but not least, we have the purple ray. 
and that is any ray that strikes the mirror along the optical axis will be reflected symmetrically about the optical axis. So our purple ray comes in like this, and we'll go back out following the same path. So all of our rays, for the most part, seem to cross in about the same location. They're crossing around here. So if I really wanted to make this precise enough to get an actual number out, I would have to get out my ruler, I would have to get out my protractor, and I would have to be very, very precise about each of these in a way that's quite frankly difficult to do on this tablet. But more often than not, ray tracing is just trying to give us an idea where our image will be rather than a precise location. So what we're expecting here is for our image to be somewhere out here. And there's a couple of things we can note about our image. First is that our image is inverted, which tells us that we expect a negative value for m. The image also appears to be larger than our object, so we would expect our magnification, the magnitude of it, to be greater than 1. And our image distance, while our image is further away from the mirror than the center of curvature, so our image distance better be at least as big as our radius of curvature. So these are some general features we expect our image to have when we go and actually do our mathematical work here. So let's actually work through this one mathematically. 1 over the focal length equals 1 over the object distance plus 1 over the image distance. Oh, we also expect our image distance to be positive because our image is on the same side of the mirror as the object. And our focal length is positive because it's a concave mirror. So plugging in some values here, we have 1 over 10 centimeters equals 1 over 15 centimeters plus 1 over di. Now it will turn out that the thin lens equation, the one we're using right now, is doesn't really care which units you use as long as you're using the same units for everything. So if we put f and do in, in centimeters, we will calculate a di also in centimeters without really having to worry about carrying our units through. And if you work through the math here, you get an image distance of positive 30 centimeters. So there is our positive image distance that is greater than the radius of curvature of the mirror. And we also know our focal length is positive already. So if we want to look at the magnification, we're then going to need our magnification formula, which we could do as image height over object height, or as negative image distance over object distance. So plugging those in, our image distance was 30 centimeters, and our object distance was 15 centimeters. So we get a magnification of negative 2. That is both less than 0, negative, because our image is inverted, and its magnitude is greater than 1, because our image is enlarged. So based on this, if we knew the height of our image, so for example, let's say our object had a height of 5 centimeters, well then we know our image height divided by that 5 centimeter object height has to be equal to negative 2, so we could find our image height as negative 10 centimeters. So my diagram may not have been perfect, but it predicted at least the big picture stuff. Was the image enlarged or reduced? Was it inverted or upright? Is my image distance positive or negative? Is my image distance bigger than or smaller than the focal length, the radius of curvature? Is the focal length positive or negative? All of these features match between our mathematical work on the right and our conceptual ray tracing on the left. So. Let's do another example with a concave mirror and put that object in a different location. So this time, 
let's put our object inside the focal point. So that means our object distance, if we keep our focal length as what we had on the last slide, 10 centimeters, positive 10 because it's a concave mirror, then our object distance might be something like 5 centimeters. And we will get to everything else as we get there. So let's draw our rays. First, the red ray. Any ray of light that comes into the mirror traveling parallel to the principal axis will be reflected out through the focal point. So that ray would look something like this. Then our next ray, which was the blue one, was if a ray travels into the mirror through the focal point, then it will travel out parallel to the principal axis. Well, we're going to have the same trouble here that we had with our green ray in the previous example. If we draw the ray of light from our object through our focal point, this ray is never going to hit the mirror. So we want to reverse the path of this light and draw this ray in this way, as though the ray came from the focal point and passed through the tip of our image there. So this ray has entered the mirror, traveling along a path that at least goes through the focal point. And this means our outgoing ray will then be parallel to the principal axis, going something like this direction. Well, hopefully you can already see that there's going to be a little bit of a problem here. Our rays don't look like they're going to actually connect with each other. But let's draw the other rays just to be sure. So like we did last time, we're going to have to reverse the path of our light ray that goes through the center of curvature as though the light ray had come from the center of curvature through our object. And this light ray will be reflected back out the same way it came in, back through the center of curvature this way. And last but not least, we have our purple ray, the ray that strikes the mirror right along the optical axis. This one right here. Oops, that's not purple. So this ray comes in, strikes the mirror right on the optical axis, and will be reflected symmetrically about the optical axis. So drawing this as close to scale as I can, this ray will come out in that direction. So we have a minor problem here. Our rays don't actually converge. So how do we locate our image here? And this will come back to what I said at the very beginning of this lecture, your eyes are dumb. You are standing over on this side of the mirror. So your brain for each of these rays will assume that they've been traveling in a straight line forever. So for the blue ray, your eyeballs are going to assume that the blue ray came from back in this direction. For the red ray, your brain will assume that that ray came from back in this direction somewhere. And the same thing for the other rays as well. So it looks like, at least, all of our rays came from this location right here. So this is where we draw the tip of our image arrow. And we have successfully located our image based on ray tracing. So now let me clear a little space and let's talk about some of the qualitative features of this image. The image is upright. So we expect a positive value for our magnification. The image is also larger than the object. So the image is enlarged. So we expect our value for the magnification to have a magnitude greater than 1. The image is also behind the mirror, the opposite side from the object. So we expect our image distance to be negative in this case. And it looks like 
our image distance and our object distance are similar sizes to each other, even if they have opposite signs. But that's all we can really tell for now. That may just be my not drawing this diagram perfectly to scale, but it looks like they're similar in size to each other. So if we got an image distance of negative 15 centimeters, we should be concerned. So think about what type of image this is. The rays don't actually cross at this point, it just looks like they all came from that location. So this will be a virtual image. And it will turn out that for mirrors at least, all virtual images will be upright and all of them will have a negative image distance. So let's work through the math here. The thin lens equation says 1 over the focal length equals 1 over the image object distance plus 1 over the image distance. So we have again 1 over positive 10 centimeters equals 1 over 5 centimeters this time plus 1 over di. And we can solve this to get the answer we need, which turns out to be that the image distance is negative 10 centimeters. So the image distance is negative, and while my diagram must not be completely to scale because the image should be further behind the mirror than this, I suspect we're running into a little small angle approximation breaking down based on how much of the entire circle this mirror is, but it's at least similar, so we'll give this one a somewhat check mark. And to find our magnification, is negative di over do, or negative negative 10 centimeters, divided by our object distance, which was 5 centimeters. So here we get a magnification of positive 2, greater than 0, and with a magnitude that is greater than 1. So our image is twice as large as our object. The last concave example I want to do is a little bit of a trick question, and you'll see why in a second, because I'm going to put my object directly on top of the focal point here. So if we still assume our focal length is positive 10 centimeters, we are going to make our object distance also equal to 10 centimeters. And let's draw our rays. For the ray that comes in parallel to the principal axis, this ray right here, that ray will go out passing through the focal point. For the ray that comes in through the focal point, that ray will travel out pass parallel to the principal axis. So this one is a little weird because this it's directly on top, so we could follow this light ray upward, and then it could hit the mirror up here, but in all likelihood, your mirror actually only goes to here and to here, so I'm actually going to leave this light ray off for now, because it's going to get a little confusing to include that one. The next one is any ray that comes in through the center of curvature, like this, will be reflected back out through the center of curvature. Uh-oh. These rays, this one here and this one here, look an awful lot like they're parallel, which is bad news in terms of trying to find the location where the image will be. And last but not least, we could draw our purple ray, the one that strikes the mirror along the optical axis and that ray will bounce back out symmetrically around the optical axis. So we have all of our rays that are exiting are traveling parallel to each other. So even if we trace all of these rays back the way they came, or the back from the direction it seems like they came at least, we are never going to find a location where all of these rays actually cross each other. So my uh, green ray might not be perfectly to scale here, but these lines should all be parallel to each other. 
So here the rays never cross, and they don't even seem like they crossed. So this means that no image will form. Let's verify this mathematically. With our thin lanes equation, 1 over f equals 1 over do plus 1 over di. Well, we have 1 over 10 centimeters for our 1 over f equals 1 over 10 centimeters for our object distance plus 1 over di. Well, these two terms cancel, so we're left with 0 equals 1 over the image distance where the image distance equals 1 over 0. Mathematicians will tell you this is undefined. Physicists will tell you this is infinity. Either way, this doesn't give us a real answer, so no image forms. If you have a makeup mirror, a makeup mirror is a concave mirror. So try looking into the makeup mirror, or if you have a spoon, a spoon's also a good example of a concave mirror if you're looking into the side you actually scoop things with. If you're further away than the focal point, the image will be inverted. So if you get far enough from the makeup mirror, the spoon, your reflection, your image that you see by looking into the mirror, the spoon should be upside down. But if you get close enough, we get into the realm of the second example we did here and your image will be upright and virtual. So if you get close enough to the makeup mirror or close enough to the spoon, you might have to get really close to that spoon, you'll see that the image is actually upright and has transitioned to being a virtual image. And at that borderline between the two, when your object is precisely at the focal point, well, we don't get any image there. So you'll just see a gigantic blur if you try to place yourself exactly at the focal length and look into the mirror. The last example I want to talk about is when we have a convex mirror. There were different cases we could have for the concave mirror depending on whether the object was inside the focal point or outside the focal point. But all of our different object distances will produce fundamentally the same type of ray diagram for a convex mirror. Recall that for a convex mirror, the focal point and the center of curvature are on the opposite side of the mirror from the object. So here, it looks like I've got my object that is at least two, if not three times the focal length away from this mirror. So let's assume we have a focal length of negative 10 centimeters because it's a convex mirror. And we will say our object distance is about... 25 centimeters. And let's do our ray tracing. So the ray tracing rules are largely the same with some slight complications. Our ray that comes in parallel to the optical axis will still go out through the focal point, but our ray is not going to go this direction because that's not how mirrors work. Light bounces off of mirrors. It doesn't pass through them. So we are going to reverse this line that we just drew and have our light ray go out this direction as though it came from the focal point. Our next ray is the ray that comes into the mirror heading towards the focal point. So our ray, our blue ray coming in, comes in this direction as though it's going to head straight towards the focal point. But as soon as it hits the mirror, it reflects, and the rules of principal rays tell us that this ray will reflect out parallel to the principal axis. Then we have our green ray that heads towards the center of curvature of the mirror. Again, that center of curvature is on the right side of the mirror. So our ray comes into the mirror this direction as though it's going to go straight through the center of curvature, but then that ray is reflected back out the same direction it came in. And last but not least, we have the ray that strikes the mirror right at the optical axis that I will draw here real quick. So the ray comes in, hits the mirror at the optical axis, and is reflected symmetrically about the optical axis. 
to the nearest of my ability to draw this mostly freehand. So we have a similar situation to what we had with the concave mirror when we place the object within the focal point. The rays don't actually cross. And whenever the rays don't actually cross, this is where we invoke your eyes are dumb. So the red ray, we, it seems like we've already traced it back. The red ray seems like it came from back in this direction over here. The green ray, we've also traced back. The green ray seems like it came from back in this direction. We could continue that along if we wanted to. The blue ray, I'm actually going to erase this dotted line we had before, because that was just the dotted line that convinced us that this blue ray was traveling towards the focal point. But we need to trace the outgoing ray back the way that it came, not the incoming ray. So when we're tracing our rays back because our eyes are dumb, this is the ray we trace back. Let me line up my ruler a little bit better here. So it seems like our blue ray came from over here. And last but not least, we can trace our purple ray back and say that it seems like our purple ray came from back in this direction. So all of our rays don't actually cross, but they seem like they crossed right here. So this is our image, and it is a virtual image because the rays didn't actually cross, or we could say it's a virtual image because our image is upright, and an upright image with mirrors will always be a virtual image. So let's look at our ray diagram and see if we can determine some things about the image. The image will be upright, so we expect a magnification that is greater than zero. The image is now reduced. It is smaller than the object, so our magnification should have a value, or an absolute value of less than one. The image is on the opposite side of the mirror from the object, so we expect our image distance to be negative. And it looks like our image is closer to the mirror than our object, so our magnitude of our image distance should be less than our object distance. And one last time, let's grind through the math to double check this. One over the focal length is one over the object distance plus one over the image distance. Same formula, the only difference with a convex mirror is that the focal length is negative. So this is one over negative 10 centimeters equals one over 25 centimeters plus one over di, and we can solve this for di to get a value of negative 7.14 centimeters. So our image distance is negative, and it is smaller than our object distance. So now we just need to calculate our magnification with negative di over do, so negative of negative 7.14 centimeters divided by our object distance of 25 centimeters gives us a magnification of positive 0.286. So our magnification is both positive with a magnitude smaller than one just like we expected. So the magnification being 0.286 means our image is about 29% as big as our object. Yes, Lillian, I hear you. So that is everything that I have today. Uh, if you go and actually look in a convex mirror, if you can find one, maybe the back surface of a spoon, you'll notice that your image in the spoon will always appear smaller and it will always appear upright, and that will match with these ray diagrams and calculations that we've done. We will come back to ray diagrams when we talk about image formation from lenses as well, and the rules will be very similar except that light passes through a lens rather than bouncing off of it. That's all I have for you today. Thank you for watching, and have a good day.